Hi, I'm Yulia, and this is Burning Questions. The topic that set the internet on fire this week is what the hell is going on with Pavel Durov's arrest and why is it so controversial? And we're going to attempt to answer this question with our guest today, who is well known on the internet as Operator Starsky. He is a Ukrainian veteran. He's also the founder of the Propaganda Study Institute, and um, I'm sure you have seen him. Hi there. Why don't you introduce yourself a little better than I did so people know, you know, <laughs> so people know a little more about you. Uh, hello, nice to see you again. Uh, my name is uh, Andrei Kulish, also known as Operator Starsky. I have a uh, blog dedicated to amazing international community supporting Ukraine. And what I do is mostly reporting um, about the situation in Ukraine, around Ukraine, and uh, debunking Russian disinformation. And as I said earlier, you're also the founder of the Propaganda Study Institute. Can you tell us a little more about that? Uh, yeah, so uh, we decided to make this uh, small organization with my colleagues from Ukraine. Uh, we have journalists, psychologists uh, in our team in order to understand uh, how exactly Russian propaganda and Russian disinformation works, uh, why it's so effective, uh, and find ways to expose it uh, and uh, fight it effectively specifically uh, around europe um, not only in ukraine in ukraine we have broad experience in fighting russian propaganda but um, unfortunately today this informational warfare is being waged on the west as well and uh, our task is uh, not only to secure ukrainian informational uh, space and protect our citizens from Russian disinformation, but also help our friends from other countries fight it. That's a great initiative, honestly. I wish that, you know, I wish there were more institutes for the study of propaganda that were also founded in the West and had, you know, Ukrainians assisting in understanding this propaganda, because honestly, it's such a big problem. And as we've figured out with this war, it seems like the West has zero clue how to fight it, how to identify it, and what to do with it, because they keep falling for, I guess, what seems to Ukrainians as the easiest, most obvious uh, provocations and the most obvious um, Russian propaganda that in the West seems to be something that people have a very hard time figuring out. So I guess this is a very good seg into talking about Pavel Durov and why his arrest seems to be so controversial, where on one side of the equation we have Elon Musk and, you know, Kim.com and all of the other definitely not Russian propagandists defending him and saying that, you know, <laughs> arresting him in France is encroaching in the freedom of speech and, uh, you know, a political witch hunt. And then we have experts on the other side saying, well, I mean, it is very evident that Telegram is a tool to spread Russian propaganda worldwide and is a very, very big tool that aids Russian disinfo operations and the invasion. So which side of this equation are you on? Uh, one thing people must understand uh, is the reason why uh, uh, Pavel Duro was arrested. And uh, the biggest reason he was arrested was because he refused to cooperate with the authorities uh, that were investigating crimes uh, conducted through Telegram uh, or using Telegram. Um, you know, as a former policeman, I would really, really like people to understand one simple fact. Uh, it's uh, the key to people's freedom is people's safety. Because when we are free, we are safe. We are safe to do what we like. Um, and people who don't understand this simple fact, they sometimes find themselves really confused when they find out that uh, their uh, children buy drugs uh, using Telegram or, for example, um, those children emerge on some particular photos or videos. Um, and uh, we uh, also must understand that freedom of speech that we all, uh, all advocate for, that we are protecting, uh, freedom of speech uh, has absolutely nothing in common with uh, freedom of hate speech, with freedom of crime, freedom of terrorism, freedom of child pornography and things like that. This is why we are fighting for freedom 
for people's freedoms and this is exactly why we are also fighting for safety and uh, that was reason number one why uh, Pavel Durov was uh, detained uh, in France and um, as for uh, Russians for example and uh, Russian propagandists that uh, protect Durov right now protect I take it in quotes mm -hmm. um, they are not fighting for, for freedom of speech whatsoever like it's even funny to consider that russia even has freedom of speech we all know that <laughs> it's it's not uh it's not so um several reasons uh, reason number one is that russian military uh use telegram telegram provides uh, good uh, protection of data um they also want to gain control over um, their own military correspondence so-called because um in Russia, there are quite a few um, Russian terrorists who use Telegram to report about the situation on the ground. And sometimes they report uh, things that uh, do not correlate with official Kremlin's agenda. They uh, report uh, like um, real Russian losses, uh, real uh, casualties among the Russian personnel and things like that. Um, and also they criticize command in some particular cases. That's why Russia uh, doesn't want them to be free. Again, they, they are not fighting for freedom of speech. The reason they want uh, Durov to be released is to find ways to influence Durov, to find access to Telegram and gain control over their own uh, so-called war correspondence that they don't control and uh, they also want to secure their own data uh, that is uh, stored on telegram that is shared on telegram which is uh, sensitive data and again if uh, for example uh, Durov starts cooperating with uh, French authorities, it automatically means that uh, Russian terrorist activities will also be um, exposed or used against Russians. So this is currently Russia's uh, biggest concern. As for other people advocating for freedom of speech, uh, I 100% support them and again, Freedom is safety. Freedom equals safety. And we should uh, think about it. Well, freedom of speech also does not grant you freedom from responsibility over that speech, right? And I think that a lot of people forget that little part because you still have to face consequences over hate speech, over, over free speech that... Um, I guess here's the difference, right? If you're saying something freely and it does not hurt or harm anyone, that's okay. But if you choose to say something and do something freely and it does harm someone else and it's now your responsibility that you have caused this to another person, then you're going to have to face the consequences. Yes, sure, you were free to do what you wanted, but now the government is free to impose the law on that, right? Uh, well, there is this other uh, thing that I actually am very interested in discussing with you is that there are two camps again. Again, one camp is thinking that Pavel Durov is this renegade, right, who left Russia because in 2014 he refused to surrender the information of Ukrainians that would aid the Russian invasion. And then there is this other camp who is like, well, but how is Telegram still allowed to operate in Russia to begin with? Because, you know, Viber is blocked, WhatsApp is blocked, Signal is blocked, Facebook is blocked, and I can continue going because there are so many <laughs> social media networks that are just not allowed. And yet this one is allowed and the military uses it and the leadership uses it and everybody uses it, but you know, it's owned by this man who's supposedly persona non grata in Russia. So um, I personally am uh, in, the, in the camp of people who doesn't think that Pavel Durov is a renegade. I do think that he aids and abets the government, and I do think that Telegram is a very useful tool for Russians to spread misinformation abroad, and likely him, uh, you know, fleeing Russia because he refused to surrender this or that information is just a cover-up story. So I wonder what you think about it. Um, I support you 100%. Uh, the reason Russians uh, still use Telegram is because Telegram is also used by Ukrainians and it's one of the most popular um, platforms that are used by um, Eastern communities, Western communities. 
And uh, this is where they can um, introduce uh, their psyops. Uh, this is where they can make um, copies of uh, legit telegram channels like Ukrainian monitoring channels and spread their propaganda there where uh, there are basically many, many cases every single day of uh, Russians uh, creating uh, fake telegram channels, channels like uh, Bakhmatsky Diamond reporting from the ground, uh, a lot of uh, military, a lot of um, press and uh, journalists are subscribed to this channel, Sean uh, Fronti, etc., etc. So many telegram channels that uh, provide legit information from the ground, um, they are being copied and uh, Russians create uh, those fake accounts um, to spread their disinformation basically um, another thing is that uh, they often scam people for example their um, uh, fundraisers for the ukrainian army or uh, ukrainian civilians uh, fundraisers to provide uh, humanitarian aid to ukraine and russians also there there were many many cases when russians would uh, create fake telegram channels uh, with uh, similar graphics similar content similar uh, names and uh, they will literally steal money. Uh, so, uh, again, this is very important. Uh, Russians don't uh, advocate for freedom of speech uh, regarding Telegram. They want control and they want to introduce whatever the terrorists do. Yeah, I think that they're more scared that Telegram is going to be banned in Europe now that Pavel Durov is arrested, because realistically there is no, you know, there is no precedent for Europe and other Western countries to, or well, I mean, Europe is not a country, <laughs> but other other Western nations to, or alliances to ban Telegram until there is testimony from Pavel Durov that is going to give them enough reason to do so, right? Because realistically, this arrest is probably also meant specifically for that. I am... Um, you know, I'm, I'm also, I mean, I use Telegram, I don't use it for any secure communications or any, any communications with soldiers, but obviously to read the news. And one of the things that really scares me, for instance, is um, I'm sure you're aware of this channel, but there is a channel called Trakanazi Merk that basically um, doxes Ukrainian foreign fighters and provides information of their family members, their wives, their children, um, you know, where they're from, links to all of their social media and on any network, for instance, like Facebook, right, that would have been flagged and that would have been taken down because it's doxing uh, anywhere on the internet virtually google will not you know route you anywhere like that because that is illegal it's illegal to dox people however telegram is okay and th i am kind of segging this to the topic of twitter because it used to be so that if you were to post a very gory video for instance let's say and that's not something I would ever want to mention, but in this scenario, I think it's applicable. But the video of the dismemberment of the Ukrainian servicemen that was um, that was posted on Telegram a little while ago, it also immediately started going viral on Twitter. Something like that would have never been allowed on Instagram or on Facebook or on TikTok or on YouTube, for instance. Like you would get demonetized, you would probably get banned for posting a dismembered, dismembered human being in a video of, of, of that happening. And it used to be so that it was only Telegram. You know, people would have this thing in their bio where like, oh, I can't post this here, but if you want to see the full thing, go to my Telegram channel. And now it's both Twitter, well, X, and Telegram. So that leads me to Elon Musk buying Twitter and uh, it coming out a couple of days ago that <laughs> no other than two Russian oligarchs were involved in sponsoring that purchase. And Twitter is becoming closer and closer to Telegram and resembles, uh, you know, the uh, misinformation uh, spreading patterns more and more. What do you think is the biggest sort of danger of not enforcing these rules and regulations onto these social networks? And do you see any links between Twitter and Telegram and how they're both used as a massive propaganda tool in Russia's favor? Uh, yeah, absolutely. The biggest threat that uh, I can see as a communication specialist is, of course, uh, Russian disinformation, because Russian disinformation is a combat weapon. Uh, the, uh, op the informational operations uh, created, developed by Russians, they are uh, utilized by Russian military personnel. The people who do psyops, psyops is a part of uh, any army. Uh, it's it's an element of uh, the armed forces, 
in any given country. Everybody who ever served knows that. Uh, that's why uh, one of the biggest problems is, of course, um, the threat that uh, Russians will keep destroying uh, democratic society from within. Uh, they will keep uh, pushing and promoting um, extremist uh, movements, far left, far right extremist movements uh, that will eventually gain power and uh, any, any intelligence expert will tell you that that all the far left and far right movements in Europe and the United States, for example, they're controlled by Kremlin. Um, it, it's not a secret. And um, as for connection between uh, Telegram and uh, X, uh, well, again, it was exposed several days that uh, there is a Russian connection with uh, acquisition of uh, Twitter, currently known as X, unfortunately. Um, not not only Russians. Actually, a lot of shady figures uh, helped Musk um, to acquire uh, this platform. There was this uh, American rap rapper, hip hopper. Um, who was accused of rape and uh, other shady people. But generally, the biggest problem is that uh, Russia found its um, access to uh, to most popular uh, platforms, uh, some of some of the most uh, used uh, on the West, um, and of course, we have to vi find ways to protect uh, to protect people from Russian disinformation, which is again military tool, uh, military yeah. weapon. Uh, I don't think that it's necessary to ban to, uh, Telegram. Uh, it, it's not necessary. Uh, there are ways when, and this is a good practice with other platforms, uh, when uh, developers cooperate with authorities and uh, when there's um, cases discovered of uh, crimes, uh, sharing illegal content or uh, selling illegal stuff, drugs, weapons, and things like that. Uh, of course, developers can cooperate with the authorities and help them find uh, criminals and punish them, uh, which is a proper thing to do. And uh, this is one of the ways we can literally save uh, people enforce and uh, ensure that they are safe, that they are secure, they can be free. Well, for sure. But I mean, it's hard to do when someone like Pavel Durov, who owns Telegram, right? And Elon Musk, who owns Twitter, who also has lawsuits in, I believe, Ireland and other EU countries where they wanted to, uh, where the question of banning Twitter had uh, had arised because they don't want to enforce these regulations and these rules and they don't want to monitor content. They want, don't want to regulate content. I mean, also in the case of... Um, of Twitter specifically, it seems like, well, first of all, for all of the naysayers who think that, you know, Elon Musk is such a free speech uh, epitome and he bought Twitter because he wanted it to be, you know, accessible to everyone. Uh, the Russians that have sponsored the purchase of Twitter are not making any money on Twitter. Twitter right now is a money pit and they're in fact losing a lot of money. So if that should tell you anything, that should tell you a lot. <laughs> so that should really give our viewers and anybody who's listening to this uh, sort of a perspective on uh, how this free speech is being is being used. And then in the case of Telegram, what if Pavel Durov refuses to cooperate with the, with the authorities and refuses to make those changes that are asked of him? What do you think is going to be the next steps? Because I think one of the biggest questions right now is what's going to happen with Durov and what's going to happen with Telegram and sort of how, what is Europe going to do next? Well, it's a good question. Uh, again, if uh, developers of uh, some particular platform don't, don't want to um, comply with the regulations, they don't want to cooperate with the authorities uh, in order to ensure people's safety, then apparently such platform should uh, not exist. Uh, that is obvious. Uh, and uh, again, it's not about freedom of speech. Uh, it's not about freedom of thought. It's about freedom of crime. It's about freedom of terrorism and things like that. Uh, Elon Musk, uh, you know, I uh, see a lot of commentaries that uh, basically uh, defend Musk uh, in some very, very cringy ways. Sometimes uh, people say, we have freedom to be fooled. Uh, which is something I have never heard before, but it sounds really interesting. Uh, there are people saying that uh, we don't believe um, that Russians were involved because uh, Musk is rich enough to, you know, to buy whatever platform he wants. Uh, 
yet uh, he was ordered by the federal judge to uh, publish the documents of all the shareholders, which basically confirms that indeed he uh, borrowed the money uh, from other investors. Uh, it's a fact. If he was rich enough to buy it, uh, he would not need to uh, have so many shareholders uh, he he took money from, right? Um, so that that's a really cringy situation. As for uh, Durov's future, I believe that uh, French uh, authorities will do everything according to law. And um, yeah, I, th I think that they will find a proper way to respond because, again, um, what happens now and specifically in France, uh, a lot of people don't like it, of course, but on the other hand, um, it's a, a proper thing when government finally starts fighting propaganda. Currently, Russian misinformation is fought by uh, numerous voluntary organizations, uh, by numerous uh, OSINT groups and things like that, but uh, they're not funded by government. And um, on the other hand, the Russian propaganda is pushed by Russian government. It's basically part of the Kremlin's machine. Uh, this is why uh, European countries and uh, American countries, they also have to find a proper way to respond. Well, I mean, to be honest, uh, and I'm sure you know this, uh, you know, as someone who works in this every day, I mean, I work in it every day, right, but on a, a bit of a different level than you do. And it's uh, it baffles me how absolutely inadequately the West is fighting Russian propaganda, right? It seems like the only OSINT communities and people that are actually doing something and exposing the reality of what's going on are Ukrainians, which I mean is also not uncanny because we had a lot more experience with this and we've lived in it ourselves for much longer. But it's quite crazy because I think that people in the West just simply don't realize the scope of Russian propaganda because when we when we say Russian propaganda, right, most people think like, oh, maybe an article or two or maybe, you know, those like stupid trolls that we see on YouTube and TikTok that are very obvious because their usernames are like American Eagle Texas 28, you know, like who's going to call themselves that? <laughs> Which real person is going to choose that as a username? Uh, but, you know, I think that what people don't realize is that these this Russian propaganda network is a massive warfare tool as big as like an army and the budget, the, the budgetary uh, sort of involvement of uh, spreading and creating this propaganda is probably bigger than most countries' GDP a year, right? So Russia doesn't only employ... Um journalists and articles it's like they're sleeper agents all over Europe and all over the North America and Latin America and really everywhere else there are also you know when we think of institutes of Russian studies at Cornell or at Dartmouth or at other colleges those professors are also not there to teach you the Russian language those professors are there to not all of them but a lot of them are there to gather information and to also put out certain narratives when he, when we think about journalists at major publications like the Washington Post or the New York or the New York Times, when we see those, those articles and you know someone, let's, let's call them a John Smith in the U.S. is like, oh my God, why are they publishing this Russian propaganda? It's, well, what do you mean why? Because this guy has, you know, this person who writes these articles is a Russian-American journalist who was put there specifically with that task. And then we have Telegram. Then we also have Russia paying for articles that originate in like India, China, other countries where they're, they're creating this sort of ecosystem of propaganda and this kind of like, I would even call, call it an ar alternate reality. And for people who want to confirm their bias, like with Ukrainian Nazis, when they go online and they Google, you know, is Azov a, a Nazi battalion, they will find so much proof that they are when they aren't because of this massive ecosystem that Russia created, both in the, in the journalism world, in the world of high academia, which is wild, in the world of b science fiction books and fiction books and non -fiction fiction books. And I think that the world just needs to suddenly, not suddenly, finally start looking at it as, as what it is. It's not just propaganda as in like, you know, a, a light core word for some articles with misinformation. It's propaganda as a massive tool of warfare that has been used in both Ukraine and the West for the past 30 years in a new capacity and before that for 100 yeah, I agree with you. Uh, the scale is enormous. Uh, for example, according to the data we had in 2017, it's uh, 
five years before the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, Russia spent uh, approximately $4 billion only for external propaganda. It's uh, data uh, according to the uh, Ukrainian uh, Security uh, and Defense Council. Uh, $4 billion spent on external propaganda channels like Sputnik channels like Russia Today, and that's just official data. It's just top of the iceberg because uh, Russia pushes its narratives um, into everything they produce, into uh, cinematography, music, music videos, um, all, all those cringy books, uh, fantasy yeah. books about, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> Battle Russians, <Sevastopol. laughs> uh, yeah, Russians traveling through time, killing Hitler, Bandera, and etc., etc., <laughs> then returning back. It's, uh, oh my God. Uh, Luckily, there, there will be a, a bit less such uh, literature because one of the uh, authors of a book called Order to Die, Prikas um, Pagibnut, he followed this order. He oh, went so uh, to fight in Ukraine, yeah, and uh, he basically followed his order. Uh, we love a but, good self-fulfilling prophecy, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, karma is a, is a nasty stuff sometimes. Yeah. Well, you know, I uh, this conversation about books also makes me want to mention, as I said pri priorly, and I feel like we never communicate this enough, right, is that when people think of these operations, they think of something like much larger that they don't come across every day. Like, for instance, like, oh, I don't read the news, so I'm definitely not influenced. Well, here's a fun little fact that I noticed. So as you might know, I've lived in the United States for 13 years until like seven months ago. Uh, so I'm freshly back to Ukraine. And most of my information space was always American TV and American news and American books and uh, things like that, right? And one of the things that I really started noticing very heavily is that we all know that there are always like Russian mafiosi and like, you know, Russian mobs and all of this stuff in all American movies. Anytime there is an adversary of any of any secret agency, it's always Russians. And in show and we have those shows like Law and Order, SVU, you know, like just like those kind of like cop shows. And anytime there is a mob, it's always Russians. So since 2014, every Every single time there was a prostitute that was caught, she was Ukrainian. Any single time there was human trafficking, they were now Ukrainian. Uh, of course, they were speaking broken Russian for some reason, but you know, they were Ukrainian. And they were always from Kiev, which I don't know where that is, but I guess we'll find out. <laughs> I don't know, because this this is Ky Kiev, but you know, <laughs> to each their own, I guess. But yeah, it's interesting because, you know, we don't think that these things kind of like touch upon us because we think of them as like, oh, they're in academia. I and go to college or like oh they're you know in the news oh i don't read the news oh they're in the newspapers oh i haven't you know i haven't picked up the new york times since 2010 it's like no it's russian propaganda is so carefully and meticulously integrated into the everyday lives of western people that you don't even notice it it's like when you th when you thought of you th you always thought of Russians as someone bad because in American movies, human traffickers and mobsters were always portrayed as Russians. In 2014, it was not good anymore to portray, you know, Russians as mobsters because now instead of fearing them, you would have a negative impression of them. So what did Russia do? They substituted the movies into Ukrainians. And then you would think like, oh, how do they do that? It's Hollywood. Because there are so many people in Hollywood, in, again, newspapers, academia, everywhere that are not there because they came here for an American dream and made it. They're there because Russia has a conglomerate that puts you where you need to be in order to make these decisions. And I think it's it starts being quite crazy and eye-opening when you start paying attention to this. And when you watch Law & Order SVU and, and suddenly, you know, there is a human trafficker named Andrei who is from Kiev and who is Ukrainian. <laughs> and you start noticing that this narrative started changing in order for people to start getting this negative idea of Ukraine about 10 years ago. You live, um, yeah. You live in Germany, right? Or am I am I mistaken? Uh, currently, I'm uh, working here with my institute. Uh, I'm a reservist, mm -hmm. so uh, as uh, soon as uh, the order is issued, uh, I will of course return back. I have nine years of uh, fighting uh, on the front lines together with my brigade uh, since 2015. Um, and uh, here in Germany, for example, we also have uh, a lot of good 
uh, practices, good examples of uh, fighting Russian misinformation. Um, but unfortunately, we also have a lot of examples of Russian misinformation being introduced uh, through uh, all kinds of media. I was going uh, to ask about that because I usually sorry for interrupting you. I just want to uh, I just want to kind of like g- give you an uh, give you a direction that I'm very interested in. Uh, I usually speak from a perspective of someone who knows a lot about the, the American infospace and the English speaking infospace. I would really want to provide our uh, our viewers an insight into what it's like in Germany and how how do you see Russian propaganda in daily life in Germany, especially given that you know Germany was influenced by Russia for a long long time. Uh, yeah, so several of their spies were found in uh, one of the uh, biggest far-right party here. Uh, not all <laughs> Russian spies. There, there were also like Chinese spies found there. It's uh, it, it's a cringy, uh, cringy political movement, actually, just yeah. in my opinion. But um, one thing that uh, I find really interesting about Germany is that you can hear news about Ukraine every single day on the radio, on the television. Uh, The reports about Ukraine are coming every single day, which is really, really important. Uh, For example, um, people sometimes uh, text me from places like Canada, United States. They go, we didn't hear about Ukraine for like weeks, even Poland. Yeah, even Poland, uh, but uh, Germany is different, and uh, I can see a clear indication that uh, German government clearly understands the threat, of course. because uh, it, again, globally, uh, Putin wants to return all the Soviet territories, Soviet-controlled territories, and uh, unite them with Russia, and uh, this, of course, includes Eastern Germany. I'm assuming um, that Germany were- also has a threat of Russland Deutsche, right? Which are the lovely Russian people that have been born and raised in Germany since the occupation of Germany and the Soviet Union and their children and grandchildren. So I would assume that Germany probably sees a lot of issues with that because they're quite um, taken over by Russians, whether they want it or not. Uh, yeah, they have this problem too, uh, but uh, on the other hand, I would say that uh, those people uh, became more assimilated with uh, European society. They, uh, A lot of them still support Putin, but uh, they were raised here and they can clearly see the difference. Um, the uh, bigger problem that we can see in this regard is, for example, in Baltic countries, um, Estonia, Finland, um, the Russian diaspora there is currently is often, you know, uh, pumped with uh, Russian narratives, Russian hatred. And um, it can be explained with the fact that uh, Baltic countries are basically neighboring countries. Uh, All the Russian neighbors, for some reason, I cannot explain, but all Russian neighbors uh, don't really like uh, Russia as their neighbor, like historically, right? What's there not to like? Um, They're wonderful. (laughs) Yeah, amazing people, amazing people. Uh, You know, the... Musk was criticized, uh, you know, for um, for uh, pushing Russian propaganda, and then his uh, followers and his uh, protectors were like, "Come on, he's giving us freedom of speech. We don't care who uh, funds uh, Twitter, even if it's Russian, but we yeah. want our freedom of speech for everyone." And I completely agree on that. You know, ISIS, Taliban, those beautiful Russian yeah. terrorists—they all deserve that. You know, Russia is the is the kind of neighbor which just came to me. I think is such a good comparison. Is maybe you will know this, but in the United States, there is always like uh, fencing disputes between neighbors. So, like you you buy a property next to someone, and there is always uh, a neighbor that's going to say, "Well, like you know, your fence is like five inches into my property," and it's such a, it's such a stupid thing because do you really need those five inches, you know? And I think that Russia is the kind of neighbor where like you actually have you've gone to court, you've shown them where your territory is and they still want to move their fence five inches into your yard because they 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 just have to and then there's always like the cameras that are pointing not to their house but to your house and they're watching your every move and you're just like what a nightmare like how did i end up here and you can't do anything about it i think that's the kind of that's the kind of neighbor that um i guess midwestern americans can relate to (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Uh, If if you take a look at the map of Russia and ask yourself, uh, how did it become 
like the biggest country in the world, I guarantee it's not because uh, all the territories like Buryatia and Yakutia and Chukotka and other places uh, enjoyed uh, vodka balalaika and vanilla. It's it, it's not because uh, because of that reason. The main reason is of course because they were conquered, uh, they were captured, and uh, they were assimilated. Yeah, of course. I mean, especially provided that, you know, all of these, like, let's start from like the most basic vain thing, right? Like none of them look like each other, as in like all of these nationalities have their particular looks, they have their particular style, as in like if you look back into their traditional clothing or into their languages or into anything, it's, it's these are completely different nations. They were all supposed to have their own borders and, you know, have their own customs and traditions, which they did, but now they don't because they speak Russian and drink vodka and enjoy balalaika because they were told to, but no country on the planet can be this big without, you know, without taking someone else's land. I guess uh, a good conclus- a conclusion to this discussion would be, what do you think, in your expert opinion, can we do as everyday people? Because it's good to say, like, what can journalists do and what can governments do, right? But what can your average, everyday viewer do in order to help fight this Russian disinformation? Like, things like, you know, things on Telegram, things on Twitter, and just generally all of these narratives that we, that we are seeing in the press. Um, not much they can do, unfortunately, because you are either a viewer, you are either a consumer of information, or you are a fact checker and freedom fighter. It's either or. Uh, as viewers, as information consumers, we never check information, usually, because it's uh, our nature. And uh, it's natural for us to get uh, excited by some incredible news with uh, enormous hype. Yeah. But but uh, not to check the source and uh, things like that. That's why um, if you really want to uh, fight Russian misinformation, you have to become uh, a fact checker. This is something that uh, you have to do if you want to help fight it. If you want to protect yourself against Russian disinformation, then... um, First of all, uh, consider all Russian sources unreliable. And the reason for that is uh, that there is no freedom of speech in Russia. Whatever Russian uh, media are producing is uh, in accordance to the Russian agenda. That's why uh, what is even the point of like accepting this information, right? Uh, it's like willing fully uh, uh, allowing, allowing other to fool you. Um, And, uh, of course, uh, you have to uh, check sources, check uh, where this information is coming from. Um, Russians have this, I would say, they have this habit of uh, taking some kind of unknown resource uh, somewhere on the other part of the planet at their main source and then republish this information in the Russian media. And then from the Russian media, it it finds its way to the Western media. Um, always check where this information is coming from. If it's Russia, then consider it uh, as reliable as information coming from like Taliban or uh, sources of ISIS. Yeah, yeah it, it's the same. It's completely the same. Yeah, I agree with you on information hygiene and literacy. I think we all need to start practicing it. I guess I would also add and see if you agree. I think that this war had has done something that's really, uh, well, there is nothing really great about a war, but in terms of information has done something really, it's good and bad at the same time. There are lots of Ukrainians who are showing events on the ground and what's happening in Ukraine. There are lots of Ukrainians abroad, diaspora or people who have moved away a long time ago who don't necessarily have any access to um, to valid information. They're reading the news the same way as we are. And I think that there are uh, a lot of people who are sort of showing everything that's happening and then taking certain like very loud headlines and spreading them because that's something they're also excited about as a consumer because they're not people who produce the information for you. They're people who consume it and then retell it to you. So I would also suggest, you know, as much as I love all of our, all of our and Western people who are super excited about Ukraine and want to spread information, I would say that also probably a good idea would be to um, 
to uh, really reconsider who you are consuming your information from because there are knowledgeable people with you know with um, sources from the military and with sources from if, if sources that come to them because they work in this field and then there are people who really really want to help but end up doing more harm than help because in reality they're just you know your everyday person who uh, who just lives in it and wants to share so I would say the big part of information hygiene is also really checking your sources and probably if you see a last name that is Russian and an article even if it comes from a big American publication maybe you want to like I don't know throw it in the trash or something and not <laughs> um, the one thing I would like to add is uh, just uh, always remember that uh, Russian psych Psy ops, uh, their psychological mm -hmm. operations are conducted by Russian military personnel, and uh, of course, all kinds of media can be biased. Uh, people say, "Okay, we will stop watching Russian media," but uh, our media are also biased. Yes, they are biased, but they don't want to kill you, and uh, that is option number one for the Russian military personnel conducting their psy ops in the uh, Western informational space. That is again something to consider. Yeah, I think uh, uh, in general, like a very good thing to sum up here is that, and I know everyone always says this, like, check your sources, don't fall for propaganda, right? But there are in reality not that many sources that are, you know, well, not no sources are foolproof. You need to make sure that, you know, you need to fact cross-check and fact-check. And I think, yeah, of course, no one wants to do that, but in the global scale of, like, living in the world in which we are living, which is practically, and I wouldn't even argue it, I would just say it directly, we're in World War Three. it's just that people imagine World War Three as like, you know, trenches and warfare and what's happening in Ukraine, but everywhere else, but we live in the the digital age, World War Three is happening on the internet as well, <laughs> you know. So I think that one of the one of the best things that people can do in order to not fall for, uh, you know, Pavel Durov's Telegram and Elon Musk's Twitter and stuff like that is to really just maybe condense your sources to people that you have consistently seen uh, seen being able to fact check themselves being able to admit they were wrong being able to present you with sources and with good information and not just sort of satisfy your confirmation bias where when you want Russia to be winning if you're a person who wants Russia to be winning you just read sources that are like yes I see if period you know and if you want Ukraine to be winning you are you're willing to believe anything literally uh, like the idea of Ukraine taking Kursk nuclear power plant in a day and you know and uh, and going we, we all want to believe that yeah yeah, yeah, we, we want to believe that. But again, it's like, you know, it's one of those things where they st these things start flying so fast. It's like, Ukraine is on its way to Moscow. No, we're not. Like, <laughs> we're excited. You're excited. You know, party in Crimea 2025. Like, would love to. Not going to happen realistically. <laughs> so, yeah, I would say uh, I would say that's probably a good conclusion. What do you, what do you think? Do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, we have to stay old we have to stay uh focused that's the word um because um it's very easy to lose yourself either in depression get demoralized by russian psyops or get too excited about uh, things that uh, don't happen in the real life uh people's imagination is uh, like uh, the greatest I don't know the the, the greatest <laughs> yeah. of 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 nature. Yeah, it's it's limitless, uh, and unfortunately, sometimes we fall for uh, the lies that our brain produces to I don't know to treat ourselves. But yeah. uh, we have to stay uh, focused, and we have to uh, fight Russian disinformation together because there is there is no other way. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise. I guess for everyone who's watching, you know, if you want to make sure that your information is coming from good sources, maybe consider watching Starsky on YouTube. <laughs> it's an easy transition. You know, you're just clicking the link that's going to be under this video and you can go consume your information from good sources. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for giving us your thoughts. And I will see you guys next time with the next question that sends th sets the internet on fire because, you know, we live in 2024, as we said, and there are many of those. See ya!